Hello everybody, um, I'm here to make a tutorial that was uh, requested by a friend on uh, how to do renders with like existing models because a lot of Blender tutorials don't t teach you how to do that. They only teach you how to uh, model an object like the donut tutorial and whatnot. They don't show you how to go about making uh, like a render with a character model that you downloaded, um, like how to pose and whatnot. Um, so I'm going to explain that. Uh, so blank scene, obviously, if, if you started with um, default Blender, because I have my own preset, you would have a cube, uh, a camera and a light. You just hit A to select all. Um, a to select all. Like tapping it twice deselects. So like Tapping once, selects all. Double tapping, deselects all. So I'm gonna hit A, and I'm gonna hit X. And X is delete. We're gonna get rid of everything. Now, we're gonna import a character. Now, this is also gonna kind of go into how to use, let's say, the Halo Archive models. I'm going to go find that file. You're going to grab collections. I cleared, I organized all this. Um, I'm going to eventually release it. But for now, we're just going to append a Mark 7. And it takes a little bit because there's a lot of armor pieces in each collection. There we go. Um, this looks a little cluttered. It's fine. Um, Rendu is going to drag this down. Also, I probably could confuse this probably a lot of people. I'm hitting Q for quick favorites, but to, to normally append an object, which is to import a object or different things from a different blend file, you would hit append here. So file append is how you grab it. Link would bring it into the file, but it's still tied to the original file import is all for your different formats these are for non blender formats if we're grabbing from blend files we're using append after that i'm just going to click and drag and you can click and drag on the corners of things and you can collapse them all we're going to collapse all these major collections this annotation thing we can hit x on all these you will select up here shift select here in the 3D viewport, hit M, hit New Collection, and type in WGT for Widget. After that, we're going to go into the collection here. We're going to select this, and Shift Selecting selects everything uh, in between. Selecting an object and Control Selecting a different object selects those separate objects, like independently. I'm going to drag these down until you see the scene collection get like highlighted. You could drag it down or you could drag it up here. It's the same thing. And it drags it into the main scene collection. After that, disable the widget collection. And this is the old rig. This won't be when I, uh, in the file when I finish it off. But we're going to get rid of it with X. After this, with middle click, we can move around like orbit. With shift middle click, we can do like this and pan around. Scroll wheel goes in and out. And numpad period is to focus on an object. Now we have this big cluster of armor because obviously it's, obviously it's all like one thing. Now we're going to expand the different collections. We have helmets, helmets, attachments, necks, torsos, torso attachments, as it goes on. And now we're going to kind of click and drag to get rid of all these. I'm going to also hide the helmet attachments because a lot of times those kind of cover up all the helmets anyway. So right now we're going to kind of maybe look for a helmet we want to use. We could do see hmm this is where the creative process comes in um let's go for a mark 5 zeta helmet 
Now, we have all these other helmets, and let's say we don't want to keep all these collections. We want to keep the file just to the armor pieces that are needed. We're going to select the top and then just above the helmet we're using. Right click, and delete hierarchy. That'll delete the collection and everything in the collection. And same thing down here. And then we're going to go helmet attachments. And we're just going to kind of go down and collapse all of these. After that, we're going to go all the way up. And now we can kind of pick uh, some attachments. Maybe ones that make a little more sense. Also recommend very much saving. So we'll call this tutorial. tutorial. Tut. I can't spell tutorial character. Make sure you always save because you don't want Blender to crash. I'm going to hit viewport shading up here. This is going to take a bit, but it's going to get rid of like our pile of the shaders. There we go. Now we can actually see what the character looks like. After that, we're going to just kind of go down the list. I like these ones. So again, I'm going to stick with these ones. Select all these, delete hierarchy. Now you have the character you want to use. For the first bit here, because we have this attachment we want to use, but it's clipping. So um, I have my shading tab here. and kind of like a custom blend file, but I'm just going to show you the better way to do it. Working with these models, the node groups are very tall. So instead of working in a vertical layout, we're going to look uh, or a horizontal layout. We're going to work in a vertical layout. So we're going to split the windows and to do that, hover in this corner until we get like a crosshair. And then we're going to drag and not like this because this is going to collapse, but we want to be more on this side. If we're on the opposite side and we drag, it's going to close. But if we're on the side, like this side, we drag, it's going to split. And then we're going to hit this kind of hashtag icon with a circle. And we're going to go down to the shader editor, which is a circle. Now in here, you won't see anything else. We hit N to hide the side panel. We don't see anything because nothing's selected. So we're going to select the helmet and we have this big node right here. These are the textures, the orange uh, nodes, and they're getting routed into the big shader here. This material, as you can see up here, this is the name of the material, is the visor. So here's where we can go in and customize the visor. Now, it does help where, you know, you can do this and you can obviously do this. But as you saw, I dragged from the thing. So you can drag from one socket to the next and that will, uh, like, how do I say it? It will, like, drag and drop. So you can drop the color into a different thing. You can drag this one up here, drag that one down here. The top, mid, and bottom color are the visor or like each zone being split up into three parts. So you can kind of see how this works a little bit. And I'll go green. You can see the green. And then the red is kind of mixed in with there. And then the blue is like the scratches. So you have like scratches and you have like a little other uh, aspects. So these are kind of each part. Now, if you just color everything the same, you get the same thing, like one solid color. Um, that's with this. And obviously you have all your other options here. So if you want less grime, you can turn that down. If you want less scratch, you can turn that down. So you have like a cleaner visor. And obviously the, for the visor, it's only the first um, thing because there's only one zone to a visor. And then we have this other node here, which is the, and I'll show you here. So we have all these scratch lines. You can stretch it or compress it along 
the x-axis or the y-axis and y is up and down x is left and right and so you can double these up you can tile these as much as you want uh, and you can kind of go from there i'm just gonna leave them default because it doesn't really affect how i use these because i always like do like a matching thing the next thing which probably most people will want to use is if you want an actual like mirror like visor or more of a um less reflective so like a rougher and this is where you would control it here this kind of also tweaks so if you want like super mirror like or thing you could do it like this this the the roughness white changes like the effect with more scratches so I'm just going to go back to default and we'll kind of hover around, let's say the 10 range for the visor. All right. Now we have the visor material done, but how do we get to the helmet material? Because we only have one thing here. Well, you can either go up here and you can hit slot one and that goes to the helmet material, or you can go down to the material icon here and toggle between here and this is very useful if you have an object with more materials it'll be in this list here so just for now we have two so you also have them up here so here is the main material and we're just going to kind of play around with some colors you know maybe we can go we'll go for like a gray like a dark kind of color and same thing, if we want, we can reduce the grime. There's lots of grime or no grime. I usually go for like a lower amount because too much doesn't look too good. And then too high just doesn't look too good either. either. Um, we're going to bring down the scratch so it's a little cleaner. You can go down a little more if you want. So more like that. And let's say we want to copy this black down to here. Well, you can do this and you can toggle off the zone and it'll copy, I didn't mean to hit that. Uh, it'll copy the first zone. So every zone you disable, but I can enable this and it'll enable zone three. And if I disable zone three with a zero, it'll just use zone one. And so this saves a lot of time and it'll copy every setting from zone one. So right now looks kind of all right. Let's look for, let's say, I'm guessing we want this one here because this is kind of this color here. And yep, as we change it, it goes down and we're going to just go even darker, let's say. So we get a really dark black and we can even up the metallic so it gets kind of a little darker. You can also bring down the scratch. I'll go 0.1. And now we kind of got this helmet. Now, let's say we want to take all these colors and bring them down to each other part. Well, you can do that by going up to the color you want to select, which is this gray here. Control C. Go to the next piece. Control V, Control V, Control V. Grime one, scratch, oops, scratch them out, point one. We have it like that. And then same thing, paste, paste, paste. And actually, because this, we want this metal to copy the top metal, we will just toggle off the zone and it copies the, the one above it. Now, let's see, a lot of times there's a lot of messing around. Ah, so now we change zone three and zone three is the undersuit. The undersuits, I always like making a very solid black. So we could even paste this or we can go a little darker. Let's say we bring it down to like that and then paste or like drag and drop and then we can go up to the scratch amount and go zero. And we have no scratch on the tech suit. 
or the undersuit, whatever you want to call it. Same thing, control C, control V, control V, control V, and scratch to zero. And there we go. You also gotta get the neck piece here because this is its own object. Uh, control V, control V, control V. Scratch roughness, oh sorry, scratch amount, zero. Control V, actually we could just disable that, disable that. We all get a solid black. If you want, you can enable one of these zones and just kind of go for like a different color. If you wanna, you know, we can go select the visor again. Go up here, select visor, control C, go back to the neck piece. Control V, Control V, Control V. Now we have blue highlights to match. We can go back to the tech suit. Control C, Control V, Control V, Control V, and scratch to zero. Oh, and then grime 2.2. And so with the arm, this piece and the rubber suit are linked. So as you can see, we're not getting a different name up here it's the arm up so we can go back to the armor control c that control v control v control v so now we kind of have this colored so one thing I will recommend doing, and I'll show you a little time-saving tip, is I'm going to go do one side. So I'm gonna do this, the uh, forearm now. I'm just gonna paste all these in. Same thing, and it's just changing values. You know, you're just changing all the, uh, the options of the shader. And the glove, we have the top colors here, which do most of the glove. It's pretty self-explanatory because you'll see which colors line up with where, but we are going to go through and zone six and we get it like that. Now we've done one side, which is good. And you might go, oh, I don't want to do that all on the other side. Well, quick little time saving tip is you select let's say the glove here and if you have the same glove on each side you can in the node editor hit a to select all control c go to the other glove hit a hit x hit control v and you just pasted the node group onto the, onto the other side so you copied all of what i like we did in here and we just put it on the other side I'm gonna do the same thing with the forearm. So A to select all, make sure everything's orange or white highlighted. Control C, hover over to the other side. Hit A, make sure everything's selected. Hit X to delete and Control V. Now we just do the same with all these pieces. Roller pad two. Oop. And make sure we select all. All X. Control V. So now we have it like this. After that, we could just go down to the belt because the belt is its own object from the chest. And there we go. We got a character kind of set up, but there is one little difference. So we can just do this now. So we can select up here and close it. Is we kind of have this weird like shading thing where everything kind of feels soft. So what we're gonna do 
We're going to select the helmet. One of the modifiers, which is this wrench. One, we want to hit preserve volume. We're going to add a modifier. And we're going to add a weighted normal. You could just search weighted normal. Switch it to face area and angle. And then we're going to on the helmet in the 3D viewport, right click, hit shade auto smooth. And it makes it kind of a little sharper. It's going to be more noticeable on the body. Which we're then we're going to do is we're going to hit A to select all the objects. Make sure everything's highlighted. Hit Control and L. And you'll have this link transfer data. I'm going to go down and copy modifiers. Now, every piece has the same modifiers. But you can see it says enable auto smooth and object data properties. That's because we auto smooth the helmet, but auto smooth is not on anywhere else. So we select everything again. Right click, shade auto smooth. And there we go. Everything looks nice and sharp. Now you can see what the difference in the chest piece. Or we'll shade smooth, shade auto smooth, shade smooth, shade auto smooth. You can even go to shades flat, but that's just different. So auto smooth is what you want with a weighted normal. And now our Spartan is set up. All right, in part two, we are going to work on a scene with the character. Now, we left off, you know, I left it just as where I was. Now, a lot of times you want to use this character in a different file, and this is what I recommend doing. I'm going to call this tutorial character with the append at the front to make it easier. And then we're going to go in and we're going to add collection. When with this selected, we'll have another collection, but with a number at the end. And we're just going to call this misc. So we have like that, and we'll put the widgets, and we'll put the rig in this collection. So now we have this universal file for the character. Then we'll, we'll, what I like doing is going new file, default, which is like my custom thing. If you were usually using Blender, like by default, you would only have general and general is the default start. Um, now I have camera three and this is just some other options. You don't need these just because default Blender doesn't have them. And now we have a blank scene again. If you have your cubes and stuff, you can get rid of them. And we want to bring our character in. So we're going to go file, append, and under OC, I want to search tutorial character, collection, and now we have append tutorial character. I want to select it. And everything's going to kind of come in again. And this is why it's very helpful to um, clean out the file of things you don't need. So all the armor pieces you don't need. And then we're going to select the rig. And I have names on at the moment. So you're going to go down to this running man icon. Go to viewport display and disable names because you don't need them. Actually, you could turn them on if let's say you want to know which each uh, thing does. Also, I realized because we didn't get rid of the uh, e, what is it, prosthetics and the other body types, so we can get rid of those now. So just right, uh, right click the prosthetic collections and stuff and just delete hierarchy. Make sure thigh and everything. Yep, we're all clean now. And now this is the scene we were going to use our character in. So I'm going to go tutorial scene. Now we have our character up here. Now you just collapse it all. And first thing, you want to bring in a weapon, let's say. So you're going to download one of the weapon files from the archive. And I have them in my infinite models, weapon armory, and you're gonna go to the blend file, look in collections. Now you have all these different things. So there's a lot here, because it says everything. And so we're gonna kind of just think about what do we want to use. Um, I don't think the bandit's in here, but we'll grab the... Where are we here? Let's scroll up. The AR. 
BR Cosmetics, BR-75, this is what we want. Battle Rifle, BR-75 Battle Rifle. The Armature and the Mesh are different collections, but we want the Battle Rifle main collection. It's gonna spawn in, but it's gonna go really small. And we can use G, so G to move. I also forgot my screencast keys, my bad. Okay, there we go. So you can use G to move, S to scale, and R to rotate. Or you can use your normal gizmos here if you're more comfortable with these here. And then the scale, you can go like that. And then you have this transforms, which does all of them. So you have that. And then you have the middle, which grabs. And then these axes just um, scale. But some of them kind of overlap. So I'm just going to kind of do it this way. Um, go to the scale tool and scale it up. And kind of the issue with this is we want to put it in the hand, but we have to like, if we're going to just shimmy it over, it's going to be really annoying. So what we're going to do is we're going to hit Alt G, Alt R, Alt S to clear everything. And I guess the default scale was really big. So we're going to hit S and scale this down. And so now this goes uh, right down in between Spartan. I'm going to select the rig, which is this, these lines here. Hit control tab to go into pose mode. And you can do this up here too. So you got ob object mode, edit mode, and pose mode. Pose mode is what lets you pose. And you can do it this way with the gizmos. So now we have that. We, what we want to do is mainly select the grip bone, which I have made for this rig. If you don't have a grip bone and you just have a normal hand bone, you can select the hand. I'm going to use the grip bone. And, I'm, and you want to hit a shift S. And then you're going to go cursor to selected. And that will bring the 3D cursor to the thing you selected. So if I have that on the hand and I hit shift S, cursor to select it, it's going to go over to here. That's the start of the bone. But I want it over here in this grip bone. So now we have the cursor here. I'm going to go down to the BR again. Oh, but we're in pose mode. And if you're in pose mode, you can't select any objects. You can only select the bones that you have active. I'm going to go back to object mode. I select the BR. And sometimes it's easier to do that. I select the BR. We're going to go into pose mode on the BR because the BR has a bunch of bones. We're going to hit shift S again. But instead of cursor to selected, we're going to go selection to cursor. And that's going to bring the BR to the hand. And now here's kind of just the point where, you know, you grab and you want to rotate. And let's say, you know, in SFM, you would usually like you can hit W or R to kind of like multiple times to change the axis uh, that you are rotating or moving along. This is up here in Blender. So you can go local and you can see it goes along the local axis of the bone. So this will make things a lot easier. You can go gizmo and you can see the Y axis is aligned with the bone. And here's kind of just the normal experience. And you can hit these squares to lock to a specific axis. Something like that. We can go grab the rotate, rotate along. And I'd say that's pretty much in the, the position of the hand. Now we just have to do is we have to check the scale. So I'm going to maybe scale it up a little bit. So it's a little bit more there, like present and not small. And what we can do is we go to item now and under scale, we can lock. So that means even if we hit Alt S to reset the scale, it won't reset. Because now, unless we do that, which does that. But we can't accidentally reset the scale. And it's stuck as is, which is what we want. Now, maybe we want now to this, what am I? Maybe now we want 
the BR to follow the hand. So we can control tab out of the BR, select the rig, select the hand, and it doesn't follow. Well, in Source Filmmaker, there's a such thing as like locking an object, but in Blender, it's a little different. Um, you can directly parent a object to the, the uh, another object or another bone. But the smarter way to do it is to use a bone constraint. And this is under the bone. So you got data for the rig, the running man, the bone, and a bone with like a lock on it. I'm gonna hit add bone constraint, child of. And now we wanna use the eyedropper to select my rig or whatever rig you're using. And if you're pairing it, parenting it to the hand, you would type in hand. I'm gonna make sure it's just the normal hand. But I have a grip bone. So grip bone.r. Select that. And the BR is gonna go a wonky. Don't worry about it. Hit set inverse, and it's gonna go right back to normal. You can exit the BR rig with control tab, select the Spartan rig, hit control tab to go back into pose mode. And now as we move, it will follow. And so now you can kind of just do your normal posing. Now I'm going to speed this up because, you know, most people I'm like starting from other software should know how to like pose and stuff. Um, I'm also just going to use like the hotkeys because I like using these better. Also, like these bones at the moment are locked to these axes, but better to just disable them. Like I'll in the final version, I'll have them all disabled. It's more just to uh, so you can properly adjust the uh, the fingers and kind of like tighten them up. Oh, um, while I'm at it, there's different pivot points. So bounding box kind of estimates the uh, the uh, the range between each bone. Active element goes by the active bone, but you want individual origins when doing multiple fingers because you can select them all and just curl them in and it's going to make life a lot easier. Same thing here. So there we go. Um, kind of got a pose, but there's a little bit of clipping here. And the quick way to fix this is to go active element. You want to select uh, this hand here and then the next hand. So this hand is the active hand. And then you want to rotate and you can see the other hand goes with it. And so this is kind of useful for just making little corrections like this. Um, but yeah, now I can go back to posing. Maybe turn the head a little bit. And then bring down the elbow. Now I'm going to go global. And what you can do is you can hit either you can hit this and you can see it like goes to the axis that is selected. Um, so like if you select the blue one, it only does the uh, X and Y. Um, but the easier way to do that is going sh G to, to move and then shift the one you want to exclude. So you can hit shift G and that will keep it moving left and right, but not up and down. And you can use these to move feet around while keeping them on the ground. Maybe you can bring down the pelvis a little bit. Maybe rotate the hips. A little more kind of a relaxed pose. And then we can go back in and tweak the hands. And something like that, you know, something simple. So we have our pose. We can hit control tab to get out. We can open our armor drop down. We can hide our rig because we don't really need it. Um, our BR went into our character collection, which might not be a big deal, might make it easier. Um, 
That's because this circle was selected. This collection was selected. So whenever you select a collection, it gets highlighted. So even if I select something else, that's the highlighted collection. Anything added will go in there. So if you want something to go into the scene collection, like just in the general thing, you would select this. I had this selected, so the BR went into there, but it's not a very big deal. But we can go into the cosmetics, obviously, and just kind of change out the barrels. I'm going to go to the stock. I'm not going to go for the fancy Japanese dragon. And because it's very simple, we're just going to leave it like that. We're going to hit Control S to save again. Now we have our character that's posed. Now we want to do the lighting. And lighting is a little different for each scene, but I will explain it a little better in the next part. All right, uh, part three, we are going to work on lighting. Um, with lighting, it depends if you are using Cycles or Eevee. Cycles is a more path traced, ray traced engine with light bounces, and Eevee is more like a game engine. Um, I'll explain lighting in both, very simple, but um, we'll start with Eevee. Now, you can't really light anything right now because we already have light and that doesn't really like might confuse a lot of people like how do we have light already well up here we're in the material preview and if we hit this drop down you will have scene light and scene world these are both disabled so scene lights means it disables all the scene lights scene world we enable scene world which is here is just a gray background when you turn it off it goes to a preview HDRI and an HDRI is a image like a 360 image that generates light. Um, it's very useful for doing like quick portfolio stuff of a model you created. Um, or let's say you want to do really realistic lighting. Um, that's outdoors. It's very useful. Sometimes indoors too. Um, it's used a lot in film when you're trying to match like, like real life lighting and CG lighting, um, or let's say CG character in a real life environment. But we're going to just disable that. And we're going to enable or like enable scene world and we're going to enable scene lights. Now, at the moment, there is no lights, but we will create a new collection and call this lights. In lights, you will go shift A. And you go down to the lights. You have a three point lighting and these are add on. I, these are, yeah, these are all add ons. Just you'll have four options. Point light, which is a spherical light that goes in all directions. So this goes everywhere. A sunlight, which creates light like a sun. And just kind of like the position doesn't matter. You can see as I'm moving around, it doesn't change because it comes from super far out. That's how it like um, is calculated. But the only thing that matters is the rotation. And so that's a sunlight. We'll hide the ones we don't need. A spotlight is the closest to source filmmaker. It's a tube like light. And you do have to go up a lot in the wattage. You're not going to have these options, but you'll go up a lot here. And then you have your size, which is the size of the bulb. So this will increase or decrease the sharpness sharpness of shadows. The cone size, so this is the beam shape under this, it'll show how wide the light is. The blend will create a blending effect from the outside to the inside. And I'll explain with a plane. So we'll go shift A, mesh, plane. It's gonna spawn by the three cursor because that's where it is. We'll hit Alt G to scale it down. We're gonna hit S or like Alt G to move it to the world center and hit S to scale all the way up. And now we can select the light again. And you can see how having zero blend makes it a very sharp light and having lots of blend makes it a very soft light. 
Now we do have these glitchy shadows, but that's just because Eevee does not calculate shadows normally. Um, we'll increase the brightness. And what we can do here is under Eevee, we can go shadows and we can increase quality of the shadows and go high bit depth. And this will create, it's not gonna look as glitchy when you render, but just at the moment it does in the three viewport. And uh, turning off soft shadows makes it just harsh regardless. So turn on soft shadows, go to spotlight. And you can see if I decrease the size to zero, it'll make it really sharp. The more I bring it up, the more the bulb size is, the softer the shadows. And so you can obviously tweak these to get different results. Contact shadows are very important for Eevee because it, it'll create, um, you can kind of see around the helmet. Um, no contact shadows, light kind of clips through and then contact shadows, it's more consistent with the, uh, the, the casting of shadows. And then after that, we have an area light. And an area light is kind of similar to a uh, point light, or like a spotlight, that it only points in one direction, but it is a lot more common uh, when it comes to uh, lighting scenes. And again, contact shadows. And again, same thing, if I bring up the scale, it makes the shadow softer. If I make it smaller, it makes shadows very harsh. The difference is with this light is you can choose different things. So you can make it a rectangle or a, a circle or a like a oval. And you can change the settings here to however you like. I usually keep it as a square or rectangle. The one extra thing with uh, the uh, area light is the spread option. And the spread dictates where the light goes. This isn't like showing in Eevee because I don't think it applies to Eevee, but it's a thing in cycles lighting. And then obviously for your color, you're going to have your color wheel or thing. So that's how lights work. If you want to duplicate a light or an object, you hit Shift D and you create a duplicate. Now, if you want these two lights to be the exact same and copy, like have linked settings, you go, you do Alt D. And now if I change one to red, both turn red or blue or whatever color and both change in scale. If I just do Shift D, they are duplicates until I make a change. So shift D is for if you want lights that are like separate or alt D is if you want to have a bunch of lights that do the exact same thing. Um, and it's good to do alt D for that reason because Blender just knows these lights do the exact same thing. They don't have to calculate the same light over and over and over again because they're doing the exact same thing. Um, so it is very helpful to link up lights that need to be linked to save up on uh, resources. So EV lighting is kind of very basic. It doesn't have bounce lighting. And we're going to go to cycles, which is the path traced render engine. Nothing changed. Well, this is our material preview and material preview is always in EV. So we have to hit display render preview. It's going to load and you can see it's calculating and it's noisy, but you can see the difference. We have no bounce lighting here in Eevee and we have bounce lighting up here. Cycles is very useful for getting more accurate lighting. One thing too, is you will have real time reflections. So for example, I add a icosphere and we move this another character. You will see 
Uh, well, maybe not with this visor roughness, but yeah, you can kind of see it there. And obviously I can lower the roughness. So I'll make the roughness two and there we go. You can see the icosphere in the visor. And if we do Eevee, we only get the light reflections. We don't get the reflections for the uh, any objects or the scene. Um, but yeah, for Eevee, or sorry, for cycles, it's very, like, um, it's a lot easier to do lighting. And this is where the actual spread of the light comes in. So you can see, as I lower the spread, it becomes really sharp, and it only goes to there. As I increase it, it becomes wider, and then up to 180 degrees. And so that is how you do lighting in cycles, or how lighting works in cycles. I'm not going to really go into too much detail on how to specifically light a character. Um, obviously, you would just kind of place the lights where you want them to be. After that, you got to add a camera, which we'll just do camera, you know, camera. And then we will place it in front of the character, or let's say um we want it to maybe like face more straight on but the camera's here and you could go like that and then like hit g and then r or you can do it in this view and you can make these changes or you could save a lot of time at like let's say you know the camera let's say the camera's like over here and over here and we'll just rotate it so let's say it's over here right you can hit Z twice to back up. Let's see, you want to rotate the camera around the character so it's a little easier to, uh, you know, get like the angle you want. Well, three cursors right in the world center. So you can go select 3D cursor. Now we're going to hit, you also have to see the gizmo move over here. Now we can hit R and then Z or Z and it'll rotate along where the 3d cursor is so this is very useful if you just want to um rotate your camera around a character to get a different angle if you want to you could select let's say the rig and i can select let's say this part here the shoulder pad i can hit a shift s cursor to select it and now out of pose mode, I can select the camera and I can rotate around there. So that's the point of rotation now. Or if let's say I want this bone to be the point of rotation, I can rotate along there and it just lets you control exactly where you want to rotate. So let's say we want the camera to be more like that, right? And you double tap. So if you're in global and you double tap an axis, it'll go into local axis. If you go, if you're in local axis and you double tap, it goes into global axis. So this is very useful if you're in global and you just want to quickly double tap to the local axis and then go back to global and then double tap just to kind of move the camera around. This option here up here that I am toggling is the overlays. So this is like the bones, the lights, anything that uh, you only will see in the viewport. So you want to see how like it see it looks like in the rend, like the final render without the grid lines or anything. You can turn that on. Um, now, something that a lot of like SFM artists do is this, if they're like, oh, I want to do a portrait render while well, they'll rotate the camera. Oh, let me rotate along the camera here. But they'll rotate the camera 90 degrees, right? And that works, but it's just kind of annoying to always tilt your head. So I'm going to undo that. And what we're going to actually do is go to output. And we have the resolution here. So instead of 1920 by 1080, 
we can type in 1080 by 1920. And now we have a vertical resolution and we didn't have to turn our camera at all. We go back to selecting our camera. This is the camera settings icon. This is your focal length. So in Blender, it uses focal length by default, but you can use instead of millimeters, you can use field of view. So if you want a 90 field of view, you know, you can do that too. If you want a 15 uh, degree field of view, whatever, like, you know, if you want to use field of view or you use millimeters, that's fine. Um, whatever works for you. I like my millimeters because it just is a little easier to think of, like, unless I'm doing like a game, like first person animation, like I'll do uh, FOV. But if I'm doing like a normal camera shot, I do millimeters. It's just easier for my brain to comprehend. So what I like is a uh, very high millimeter focal length. Um, so everything looks kind of really like flat um, and not if I do 25 and I pull the camera in, it kind of gives this kind of look versus like a 90 gives everything kind of a more flat look. After that, we have our depth of field. Now I have an add on that shows the distance like Source Filmmaker. This is going to be in thing normally. The way to see normally is to go limits and then I will go out of the camera and I will turn on my overlays and this icon here and you can actually click and drag it. And when I click and drag, you can see the distance actually changes of where the focus point is. So this is where you can pull it in or you can just do it this way and that'll this is where your camera will focus. So we can go back to our camera view and camera view is numpad zero or you can hit this icon here. F stops F, F stops is how wide the blur is. So let's say really low you're only going to get a very little bit in focus and a very high you're going to get a lot more in focus. So I find like a 1.4 to 2.8 works pretty good. Blades are for a bokeh effect, which is commonly seen on cameras. I like a bokeh of eight. Um, and the ratio kind of just stretches the bokeh out in different ways. Um, now, for example, we don't see any bokeh because there's nothing to display. But I will kind of set up an example of what that would look like with some bokeh. So uh, I made a little plane with kind of like some glowy dots on them and put them in the background. And this is kind of like what the bokeh effect is. We can move them back even farther. If we wanted kind of fit it in and it's this effect here. Now we can even go in and change the bokeh. So, you know, you got like two, uh, you need, need at least three for it to show up, but you can go in and create kind of different shapes. I find uh, actually five to six creates kind of like that nice hexagon or uh, octagon kind of effect. So um, that's what bokeh is and ratio just kind of stretches them out or let's say squishes them uh, like depending on how you want it. Um, and then the rotation makes them spin. So that's what the bokeh is when it comes to your depth of field. Um, and yeah, I can scale these up if I wanted to and keep them in the background. Um, now for a very simple character render, you don't have to really do much. I'm going to just hide the feet because the feet are kind of the hardest part to like if the feet are floating in a void it's just not going to look right so we're going to do it like that and then if we want we can grab our 
grab the object in the background and kind of just scale it around. We don't really have to use it, just as an example. Now our world of lighting is gray. Where are we here? Uh, surface. And then if we turn it to zero, it is completely black. And then we just have our lights right now. Um, and this is kind of like if, let's say, you want to do a, a very basic void light scene. You can do it like this. And we'll just kind of change the color, let's say, to something maybe bluish to fit. And we can up the color, up the brightness, I should say. I should say. I can't speak today. Uh, and what we're just doing is we're kind of just moving the lights around and kind of positioning them off in different places. So we have kind of a simple shot like this. And then to render, you want to go to your samples and not go to something that high. You want to use the open image denoiser. And then light paths, you can, like I just leave it for default. And then what you do is you go to your rendering tab and you hit F12. And background is going to show up again. That's just because I hid them and didn't delete them. But it isn't the end of the world. And as we go through, it will calculate out all the uh, samples because the samples are calculating here. This is the remaining time. This is how much time it has gone through the frame you're on currently if you're doing an animation. And yeah, so this is kind of just how you set up a Spartan with a Spartan pack. Um, let's say too, obviously you're going to, you know, look at things and maybe you don't like them and, you know, hit escape to cancel your render. And we're going to go back in and what I'll do is I'll just, and I usually like using this just to make it a little easier. And now we're more in focus here. This again, you won't have a normal blender, but in the uh, limits, where are we here? Here we go, camera. Under limits, you kind of want to just pull it more to the front. Um, if there's a specific point you want to focus on, what you can do is go Shift A and add an empty. You can add any kind of empty. But let's say we had a cube empty, or actually use a sphere empty. A sphere empty looks like this, and what it, and an empty doesn't have any data. It's not going to render. So if I go into rendered mode and I disable it, it's not there. Um, so it's very useful for creating things like or controlling where something should go. So we have this empty here. What we can call this is camera focus. Select our camera, go down to the focus object, and we will select that. Now, wherever we move this, the focus will go. So let's say you want to maybe put it a little more in front, kind of, because it's where this middle point is. You're more like focus on the face. Um, the left and right doesn't matter too much, but we're going to focus on the visor of the helmet. We can then save overlays, go here. There we go. You can zoom in, make sure everything's nicely in focus. You can see the helmets in focus, the guns in focus. Maybe the forearms aren't too in focus. So what you can do is go camera. Instead of a 1.4, you go to a 1.8. If it's still not enough, you go to a 2.8 and just kind of change the setting there. And then after that, we just go back to rendering. And I'll just uh, unhide everything, let's say. Or we'll get rid of the two other lights here. 
and we'll get rid of the background lights. Uh, we'll keep the floor though, because the floor creates bounce light, so it works. Um, if you want to create that infinite background effect, you can grab, so you grab the plane, you will select the edge, and you have vertex select, which is each point, uh, edge select, which selects the edge, or face select, which selects the whole face. What we want is edge select, and we're going to select this edge, and we're going to hit E, and then hit Z to lock it to this axis. So we extrude another face. So it's like now a floor and a wall. After that, I like going to the modifiers tab, add modifier, search, bevel, and you can see it's starting to bevel this part here. This increases the size of the bevel, and this increases the amount of segments of the bevel. So what we can do is we can uh, turn up the thing to maybe 25, increase the amount, and then because it's usually set to uh, shade flat, you want to hit shade auto smooth. And we go back to our camera, look through it and turn on render mode. And here's kind of where you can play with the background, but just kind of, you know, creates a nice slope and you can, let's say use G or the gizmos to move it around. And now we just can hit render now. So we have the ground, we have our character and we have a little background. And what I will do also is a very recommended tip. Go down to your camera under viewport display, pass part out. You want to turn that up. This is like the see-through part of your camera. You can have it like really high, but still see-through, but just like enough to where you could tell you like your brain knows exactly. Okay. This is the, where you want to, uh, you know, this is only what's in the camera because even if I have it really low or let's say I don't have it on to me, I'm looking at the shot and I go, okay, the feet are visible, but in reality they're not. So let's say now that we have a ground, we can move camera down, camera back along the local Z axis. And now we can render like this, right? We bring it down a little more, bring it a little closer. And I'm hitting G Z Z to do local. So now we have the camera here. And the one advantage of using a focus object is the focus will always be on the object. So even if you move the camera around, you can see the point of focus is still always there. So you can move the camera around and you get a lot more freedom when it's like when the focus is locked to something. But now we have it, you know, uh, focused on an object. We have our depth of field set up, we have our bokeh set up, which isn't really needed at the moment. Um, we have our character posed. We have our lights, which are only three, but it's all you really need for a scene like this. And we hit render, or go to the rendering tab and hit F12 again. And then it's going to go through, it's going to calculate. For a scene like this, it's a little very, like, very simple. We could even just cut the samples down. So we'll just go like 120. We don't need a whole 500 for a scene like this. So our render is done. Um, in your normal Blender, you will go to your view, tra view transform. And you won't have this many options, but you'll have AGX and AGX will make things look a lot nicer. Um, and then after AGX, you can go, let's say very high contrast or let's say medium contrast. Again, you won't have this many options. You'll have just have a very like simple, um, and then you can turn on curves and you can change your contrast levels to something 
not too bad. Let's say if you don't want too much contrast or more contrast, you can do it here. If let's say I want to reduce the blues, you can do this here. Let's say I want to reduce, let's say oh, that's reducing the reds. So reducing the blues would go here. Increasing the blues will go there. Let's say we increase it just a little bit. So it's a little more bluish. And then you can just go to save image and then save as and save your image. So that's how you do a, um, a, uh, a render with a pre-existing character in Blender and using the Spartan pack from uh, the Halo archive that I'm going to re-rig and uh, post eventually once it's all finished. So like the video, give it a like, share, share it with your friends that are learning Blender, um, subscribe, do whatever you want to do. And uh, yeah, go make art.